and I am not necessarily an Egypt specialist, but I care and understand and research the relationship between Canada and countries like Egypt. And so the focus of my presentation is not on Egypt necessarily, but more on the relationship between Canada and Egypt and how that has changed over time. I've taken a bit of a historical approach, and one of my arguments is that Egypt is often seen from the outside as politically divided between political Islam on the one hand and Christianity, secularism, and the international community on the other. And I would like to suggest that instead it may be better understood as perhaps more of a divide and inequality between the population of, if I'm not mistaken, 82 million people in Egypt and the elite in Egypt who have cornered much of the economy and partnered effectively with the international community, including Canada. And that that is a far better way to explain things, how things have progressed over time and how things may play out in the future and possibly even to better understand relationships between Canada and Egypt, where they may go and the consequences of that. So I would start out by acknowledging that the work that I do is thanks to three other researchers. In fact, there's a fourth one missing, Fatima Salem, a professor, visiting professor at the University of Ottawa. Ruby worked for many years for Global Affairs Canada, at the time it was known as the Canadian International Development Agency. Nicole is completing her master's degree in international development and global studies, has worked for UN Women, as well as currently working for Global Affairs Canada in their foreign policy branch. And Khaled Suleiman completed his PhD in Egypt and his master's degree at the University of Ottawa in feminist and gender studies. So this is the beginning of the presentation and then I'm gonna give a few quick definitions and then there's uh, a bit more to the overview as well. So I, I'm using here the word gender equality, but better I should be using the word gender justice. It better fits the situation at present and the situation that feminists are working toward. And I'm going to explain very, very quickly, very superficially, a history of, of women's rights in Egypt and a history of government responses to demands for greater rights. And I'm going to nickname this government response state feminism. And I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by that. But essentially, it is a usurping of legitimacy and a voice uh, by the government in a way that um, takes away from feminist calls for change. The instrumentalization of women's rights is something that refers to both Egypt and the international community in the sense that everybody can feel good about projects that, for example, give microcredit to women and so on, while forgetting that many of the social justice calls that are required for gender justice are being ignored. And then I'll move on to Canadian and Egyptian business interests. But first I should define a, a counter-feminism to state feminism, which is a quote from an Egyptian feminist who at one point was part of a national committee to, to put forward women's rights and to advance it as a state priority. And she says that she wants to think of a new concept of serenity. So in addition to understanding the concepts that are shared by feminists all over the world and the concept of gender justice, there was something very particular to Egypt and this notion of serenity. And the, the recognition that that was the end goal, but that it was created through very tangible and material changes and in inequality, through more equal education, health, through more representative media that is not censored, uh, through infrastructure and all the kinds of requirements to allow for individual and collective empowerment. So then I'll move very quickly, and in this section I have very few points or notes within the, within the slides, and instead I'll just uh, give you some small anecdotes from a paper. So the, the paper that I'm, I'm basing this presentation off of is a jointly authored between these four authors that I named a moment ago, that will be published, it will be a book chapter in a forthcoming book from McGill and Queen's University Press on gender and Canadian aid. And so our chapter is on Egypt as a case study, whereas the larger book as a whole is on gender and Canadian aid. And 
the degree to which gender was either mainstreamed or marginalized in recent years. And it looks particularly at the years roughly from the mid 2000s to the mid 20 to, to, to the present, essentially. So this is one of the greatest contrasts that occurred about the beginning of the time we were writing this chapter. And it, 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 it was as if witnessing something very odd and very strange and wanting to explain it. And this particular instance was something that we used to help us guide what we, what we wanted to ask and what we wanted to understand and why. How is it possible that our Minister of Foreign Affairs can be sitting in a conference deliberately to combat sexual violence and then at the same time as 54 women are raped in detention by policemen in Egypt, he says nothing, Canada says nothing, there is no official statement. We have on our website, the global, it's now called Global Affairs Canada, we have on our website moments where we express solidarity as a country. Canada would like to condemn the persecution of Christians in Egypt. Canada would like to condemn the burning of churches in Egypt. Canada would like to express solidarity with, and so on. No statement was issued, and no statement has since been issued, to my knowledge. I'd love to stand corrected on that incident or any similar incidents. This is some details. I won't read it for the purpose of the video. You don't even want to know uh, of what was the women were forced to do. I could mention, for instance, that two women, uh, two cases um, were women who were raped more than 14 times in a single day within the camp. And there, were, there was one woman who was raped daily for an entire week in one of the police stations. It's just the tip of an iceberg of the persecution of women and gender-based violence that is committed against both women and men. So in that context, our website for the Government of Canada in 2012 stated that we, Canada and Egypt, have a mutually beneficial partnership founded on a common interest in peace, stability and security in the Middle East. And any time you would write in 2014, 2015 to the government to say that we have, we take issue with the Canadian government's current support, we take issue with the Canadian government going back on its statement that this was a military coup, we take issue with the Canadian government attending business conferences and so on. Any, any formal written work sent to the government would come back with a response of the government of Canada would like to support stability and security, stability and security. Members of parliament would talk about stability and security. You could even write about Canadians imprisoned in Egyptian prisons and the Canadian government would come back and tell you, but we care about stability and security. So Canada has had a, an aid relationship with Egypt since 1976. So that's the Canada side. Egypt has had an aid relationship with the rest of the world since much, much longer. It has been food dependent since the 1960s. But the Canadian relationship has started in 1976. We have a gendered focus on that since 1993. That's not an insult to Egypt as much as it is to Canada that it took that long. Women and girls comprise the overwhelming majority of the beneficiaries of Canada's 2001 budget. However, that budget was changed in 2011, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. So our gender focus was defined very much in market economy terms, even at the best of moments, to support women and small to medium enterprises, to improve basic education, and here's the key human resource development for women and girls and any projects that would actually improve both A and B. So we were very business oriented, we continue to be very business oriented, but we at least were women's business oriented at the time. Canada moved toward a policy that was closer to gender justice and today our stated foreign policy is about gender justice. So we're moving in the right direction. Meanwhile, what was happening in Egypt. So in Egypt, there were calls for greater women's rights. No surprise there. You could take any indicator, any index, literacy rates, healthcare, any kind of index, and it would demonstrate gender inequality. Egypt was sitting at about 109 in the world in the gender gap equality index, for example. In response to calls for greater equality and greater equity, the state decided to create institutions. No surprise, the institutions were run by the wife of the president. 
They, the institutions were meant to change laws, but no surprise, the changes in the laws were named after the wife of the president. This was such a prevalent trend that both people within Egypt and international observers started to call it state feminism. And it was almost a sarcastic term, as is to say, this is not real feminism. I'm saying a lot of things that I presume you already know, so I'm going to move a little bit faster through this section. All this to say that at the same time as these supposedly progressive laws were moving through, women's organizations who were pushing for such laws were being repressed. Suddenly you had to register yourself if you did any form of criticism, you could easily be shut down. There were no safeguards for your existence, for your continuation, for your rights, and for your continued right of free speech. And so it was a very controlled atmosphere. You needed a, approval from the Ministry of Interior for a public meeting, a rally, a protest. It almost defeated the purpose. Gender inequality dropped, uh, sorry, gender inequality rose, so the equality dropped and the inequality rose. Egypt became ranked 125th out of 134 countries. Violence against women was prominent, particularly sexual harassment. Female illiteracy is standing, was standing at 58% in 2010, and gaps were seen in every other index, particularly labor force participation. Political participation was a ratio of zero, sorry, decimal zero to so if you don't want to show the world that you have two women for every hundred men in your parliament, therefore you create newly invented women-only positions in parliament, you play up the legal changes that have been done and so on. The instrumentalization of women's rights served to cover up some of the egregious inequalities, such as, for example, some people claim, academics and media alike, that 60% of the Egyptian economy is dominated by the patriarchal structure of the military. 60% of the economy. You're talking, I'm, I may have a listing of it, but essentially the entire um, domestic, uh, um, what's it called, tourism, right? So the main hotels and the chains and so on. Some of the essential elements of the Egyptian economy uh, were, were dominated by the military. I'll see if I can get you the list of the sectors that are dominated, but essentially you take every major sector in Egypt, with the exception of about two or three where Canada is aiming to move in, and they were all privatized, and that privatization was essentially the concentration of economic power in the hands of the military. About $15.7 billion worth of public assets were privatized. So what does that mean? That means that the public is putting their taxes, so Egyptian public money, is being spent to build up businesses, and then the businesses are sold for very, very, very cheap to private sector, who then profits from all of this public investment into these enterprises. That's the story of Egypt's economy, and that's where we see feminists trying to work for not only gender justice, but social justice. So in 2011, I had promised you that I would talk about the changes in the, the, budget, the aid budget and the vision for Canada-Egyptian relations, and particularly in the aid sector. In 2011, um, and prior to 2011, there were these case studies, these business case studies. And as a result of that business case study, gender was dropped much lower in Egyptian priorities and other things were upped. And that policy has yet to, ch to properly change in Canadian foreign policy. So we've had a change of government in Canada, but have we had a change in foreign policy priorities and the way we see Egypt? So essentially what I'm trying to explain is that in 2011, as a result of these business case studies, Canada said, okay, where are we going to make our buck in Egypt? And we'll put our aid dollars in support of making our Canadian buck in Egypt. And that's a very crude way of putting it, but it is essentially reflected in documents that, through a freedom of information request by a media outlet in Canada, were released by the Canadian government. So the program itself actually shrank. One of our co-authors, as I explained, worked for the government and witnessed firsthand 
her colleagues in Egypt being sent home. So the gender officer is sent home, and the project officers are sent home, and the people working in aid are sent home. Instead, Canadian and Egyptian business interests become the priority. So aid drops, so from 20 million a year, it drops down to 1 million for all aid to Egypt per annum from 2011 onward. So it becomes 5% of what it used to be. And then feminism in Egypt becomes a tool to depict the president as the defender of women and liberalism. It always has been, but it becomes even more, in a way, violently so. So the background to some of the women's movement and some of the women's actions is to gain recognition and to, it is important for the international community to recognize the women's force behind the revolution of 2011. So the greatest protests, the buildup of protests that happen in the years prior to the revolution take place in, for example, textile factories. Well, who is working in the textile factory? Who are the workers? We always, very often many people think of workers as men. Workers are men, you know, the Marxist revolution is men rising up. Workers are men. Textile workers sitting at sewing machines in these factories day and night are, are very frequently women. The World Bank has pushed Egypt to hire more women, to cut, you'll see this in a moment, to cut maternity leave. They've said, look, these maquiadoras, and there's actually a World Bank document, it's dated, but it's published, a World Bank document that says these maquiadoras in, in Mexico are working fantastically. You just repress women's rights and, you know, forget labor rights, absolutely, and you can make your money out of that. And that's the model that World Bank tries to push on, on Egypt. And of course, Egypt, you know, this privatized economy, 60% in the hands of the military, takes it on. And I, you'll see the citations in here to Chowcraft and Haniya. Adam Haniya has written, I think, one of the definitive books on the Egyptian economy. In a larger context, he does research actually in the Gulf on migrant labor. And so he, he very much understands the changes that are happening. And he describes how it's, you know, this revolution in 2011 doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes out of the privatizations. It comes out of the dispossession, the land dispossession of agricultural workers. The main uh, people to lose out of that were female farmers, women, women landowners. So here we go. The largest textile company in Africa and the Middle East, and the second largest industry, which is textiles in Egypt, goes on strike. Who are, who are on strike? No offense to the men, but it's the women who go on strike first and the men join them afterward. So after the revolution, there is this eight person committee who's saying we want a vision, this is our vision for a new Egypt, for an Egypt that takes gender justice seriously. We're going to look at gender justice around the world and how people aim for it. We're going to try to create our own Egyptian vision, uh, Egyptian women and men together. <coughs> Doesn't last very long. The Minister of Defense that's been appointed is a general who defends to Amnesty International, to the world and on BBC News, that it's okay to commit rape against women because you're protecting them from rape. The circular logic behind that was observed immediately by everyone who ever read that quote. What is little known, however, is the connection that he was the person behind these virginity tests and he was the person who then became president. So through a coup, of course. So we're, is it, it's the 12th today. So two days from now is the third commemoration of the massacre of over a thousand civilians according to Human Rights Watch and thousands of others. What the director of Human Rights Watch called one of the world's largest killings of demonstrators in a single day in recent history. Not a very nice way to remember Egypt. He, he continues, the, the director of Human Rights Watch, continues to say this was not merely a case of excessive force or poor training. It was a deliberate, violent crackdown. It was planned. It was at the highest levels of the Egyptian government. Those same officials, this is an indirect reference to Sisi, are still in power in Egypt and have a lot to answer for. Canada initially called it a coup. I spoke with people who worked in the embassy at the time, and since come back from Canada, and said, yes, you know, our official policy was to call it a coup. Within a week, however, that policy had changed. After the coup, 
it, Egypt was ranked as the worst country in the Arab world to be a woman by the Thomson Reuters Foundation. Dress restrictions were reinstated, university students were forbidden for political activity, and that forbidden is a violence in itself because the moment they do anything that is accused of political activity, then that justifies the violence that is used against individuals who are innocent of having done anything criminal. Stop and search procedures have been instituted. Again, this is an opening up to harassment. The moment you can stop and search someone, confiscate their documents and so on, you can control them, abuse them and harm them. And sexual harassment, harassment rates have risen sharply. That's a soft way of putting it, shall we say. Women and girls from across Egypt have been kidnapped, imprisoned, tortured and killed. Teenagers have been sentenced to 11 years in prison. This is a problem because we can write off the military as the military. We can write off the police as the police. It's not so easy to write off the judiciary. When you've got the judiciary supporting sentences of 11 years in prison to teenagers, essentially children, that is a serious problem. When um, women as young as 17, as young as 11, girls as young as 11 are sentenced to 10 years of imprisonment, that is a serious problem. When the judiciary, the one, you all often think of the judiciary as your last recourse for human rights, is the one sentencing you and the one violating your human rights. And there's a serious issue that I think Samat was referring to in stability as well in the long term. So the World Bank played no small part in this, Canada played no small part, unfortunately, and the international community has played no small part. To lengthen the work week, to drop pensions, family allowances, annual leaves, wages, severance pay, and most importantly, regulations over hiring and firing. These are seen very often as generic labor rights. But as a woman, you have to see these through your lens. If you have no regulations over hiring and firing, and you're told you must do such and such with your boss, otherwise or else you will be fired, you have no regulation, you have no recourse, you have no justice. So either you lose something that's very valuable to you physically, or you lose your job. And that kind of choice to a mother of children who she needs to feed would be a very terrible choice. And through labor conditions changing, that is the choice that women would be forced to face. I mean, the, the implications are not very fun to think about, so I don't want to elaborate. But all that to say that rather than thinking of labor conditions as something abstract, our role as Canada in upholding terrible labor conditions and, and failing to say something about them and to be involved through our private sector is a very serious role indeed. So we may not commit the violations against women. It may be their boss. But to have enabled that structurally is something that we should not be party to. So this is just again going back in the history. So literally a handful of families are profiting as nearly 70% of the Egyptian population survives on food rations. And another 19%, so up to 89% of the population have nothing at all. That is a United Nations quote. That is not a... Egyptian human rights organization, that is not some um, peripheral organization that is seeking the Marxist revolution. That is the United Nations telling us that 70% of the Egyptian population is on food rations and 19% have nothing at all. So this is historic, it goes back decades. The slides show that, as I said, I don't want to go into the detail of the, the, the violent contradictions, what children suffer versus what developers benefit from economically, the ways in which the economy was cut, cut, and cut again that we as Canadians have yet to stand against and to say something about. And the worry is that we continue to promote our commercial interests in Egypt. The petrochemical resources are a priority. The water sector, the transport sector, any sector that we can gain an economic foothold in is a priority. That we continue to attend business conferences with a government that is openly and explicitly a military coup. We continue to send aid, including military aid. We, we don't just provide military aid, we sell arms. So the shocking statistic that very few people know, and it was uncovered by an investigative journalist in Canada, is that our arms sales didn't increase by 100%, or even 10,000, uh, they didn't increase by 1,000%, or 10,000%. Uh, 
Our arm sales, and I have to get this number right for you because it's just too big for me to remember. Our arm sales went up since the coup from $4,000 to over seven point, under $4,000 a year to over $7.2 million. This is the coup buying military arms to support the coup from us who are happy to sell them. That's a jump of 182,873%. And that is a role that we need not present. That is not a role we need not take part in. The indigenous peoples of Canada are saying that on our land, we want to have a peaceable nation. We want to have a war-free nation. The people who actually own Canada are saying, we don't want to sell arms. We don't want to produce arms. And we don't want to take part in other people's military wars. And we definitely don't want to take part in the repression of people by a government that is meant to represent them. And that is the indigenous peoples of Canada. When will our Canadian government stand up and say, that's our position too? Not only do we believe in reconciliation with indigenous peoples, but we'll actually listen to them on foreign policy. That would be something new. And that is what we need to be as Canada. Thank you very much.